When we introduced the idea of a first order reaction, I mentioned that changing the initial concentration of the sample adjusted where the curve starts, but doesn't affect the shape of the curve. Let's make that idea a bit clearer by shifting the bottom curve to the right. This suggests, perhaps not surprisingly when you think about the form of the integrated rate law, that the shape of the curve really depends on only one parameter, k, the rate coefficient. When we look at the differential form of the equation to determine units of k, we find that k has units of per second. So when we look at a particular value of k, that tells us the rough time scale. In this case, the reaction happens in seconds. In this case, it happens a lot in a second. The time scale is microseconds, and in this case, it happens only a few times in a second. The time scale is in hours. But making that connection to the time scale from the rate coefficient can take some minor mental gymnastics, so frequently a different way of expressing the information is used. The half-life of a reaction is the time it takes for the concentration of a species to reach one half of its original concentration. Notice that for a first-order reaction, you get the same half-life regardless of the starting concentration. We can see why this is from the integrated rate law. We plug half of the initial concentration in for the left-hand side, and the half-life in for the time. Cancel. Take the natural log of both sides, and solve for the half-life. So for a first-order reaction, the half-life contains the same information as the rate coefficient, but it presents that information in a way that more clearly tells you the speed of the reaction. Let's look at the example of nuclear fission, which follows first-order kinetics. Here we have a periodic table where the elements are colored by their half-lives. Blue are long half-lives, red are short half-lives. It's a little more complicated than that, though, because different isotopes of the same element have different nuclear fission half-lives. Uranium-232, for example, has a half-life of 68.9 years, but Uranium-233 and 34 have half-lives in the hundreds of thousands of years. Uranium-235 and 236 have half-lives in the tens to hundreds of millions of years. Uranium-238 has a half-life of billions of years. Amazingly, by comparison, Uranium-237 has a half-life of only six and three-quarter days. Uranium-239 has a half-life of over 23 minutes, because these two isotopes decay by a different mechanism than the others. The naturally occurring isotope with the longest nuclear half-life is tellurium-128 at nearly 8 times 10 to the 24th years, a half quadrillion times the age of the observable universe. And the synthetic isotope with the shortest known half-life is hydrogen-7, a stunning creation with a single proton and six neutrons, which has a half-life of only 23 yakta seconds. Yes, that's a word. Atomic physicists will summarize this information in a chart like this one, where the nuclear charge is along the x-axis, the number of neutrons is along the y-axis, and the half-life for the particular isotope is color-coded. The isotopes with long half-lives are the ones we interact with on a daily basis. The ones with short half-lives only show up briefly as a result of radioactive decay, or are made, again only briefly, in particle accelerators. The important implication to consider is the concentration levels at multiple half-lives. At one half-life, our concentration has dropped to half of its original value. At two half-lives, our concentration has dropped to half of that half, or a quarter of its original value. At three half-lives, our concentration has dropped to half of that quarter, or one-eighth of its original value, and so on. Each half-life reduces the concentration by half again. You never fully run out of the original. So that is the half-life for a first-order reaction. Unfortunately, the situation isn't as clean for a second-order or zeroth-order reaction. In both cases, we find that the resulting half-life does depend on the concentration at the start of the measurement. Here we see the half-life for a second-order reaction getting progressively longer as the reaction progresses. And here, for a zeroth-order reaction, we can see the half-lives getting progressively shorter as the reaction progresses. As a result, half-lives are used quite frequently for first-order reactions, but only very rarely for zeroth or second-order reactions.